was fun for me, what I really enjoyed was that their personalities were so different. So you have two very different uh, views. Um, Bessie was the one who was, she was the little sister. She was very outspoken and very, uh, she used to describe herself as feisty. Sadie, who was the teacher, who was two years older, she was more, she was calmer and um, she didn't take things as deeply to heart as Bessie did. So this actually allowed me um, a wonderful opportunity to get two very different viewpoints of historical events that they were talking about. And sometimes they would argue, which was great. I loved it. Um, they were, it was very charming to tell you the truth. So to see these two women, I have a sister who's two years older than I am, not even. And um, to see them kind of quarreling over this, over things that they had been quarreling about for a hundred years, and then they would laugh at themselves. It was, it was really just very charming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your work, Amy. Um, I read the book many, many years ago and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and I really appreciate how you honored their viewpoints and their personal narratives, especially given that they'd seen so much over the decades. And so my question to you is, what do you think is the most important part of the book, historically speaking? Well, the book does, it covers a lot of ground because the sisters not only lived to be a hundred, um, they could reach back into time. They knew so many people who had been enslaved. Um, so there's this huge swath of American history that the book covers. But I think in terms of probably what's the most important contribution is the Jim Crow, uh, the Jim Crow laws, when they started, they were little girls. And this is very important because I think a lot of Americans don't really understand how bad Jim Crow was and how long it went on. And of course, it's still going on. Um, a lot of people have studied, they're aware of slavery and some of them know about reconstruction, but they don't realize, I think, just how devastating these Jim Crow laws were and how long and how they held people back um, and how much that has carried over into our lives today. So the sisters remembered um, the beginning of Jim Crow in Raleigh. It was different in different places, as you know. Um, whenever the city council would ever pass laws and they were very individual laws, um, so the fact that they could remember when Jim Crow laws started, they literally remembered the day that changed. Um, a number of historians have told me that's really, really important. It's just not a lot on the record of people having this, uh, having written, saved these experiences from before and then after. I think, am I supposed to read? I think I was gonna read a little bit Is this one you, Eileen, this one I should read a little bit about um, we encountered Jim Crow laws for the first time? Yeah. Uh, that should would be, that, that, would be should read that now? No, do it. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. This is just, this is one of my old hardcover copies. I'll tell you what, what I mean here by, uh, this is both sisters. We encountered Jim Crow laws for the first time on a summer Sunday afternoon. We were about five and seven years old at the time. Mama and Papa used to take us to Pullen Park in Raleigh for picnics. And that particular day, the trolley driver told us to go to the back. We children objected loudly because we always liked to sit in front where the breeze would blow your hair. That had been part of the fun for us. But mom and papa just gently told us to hush and took us to the back without making a fuss. When we got to Pullen Park, we found changes there too. The spring where you got water now had a big wooden sign across the middle. 
On one side, the word white was painted, and on the other, the word colored, quote unquote. Why, what in the world was this all about? We may have been little children, but we got the message loud and clear. But when nobody was looking, Bessie took the dipper from the white side and drank from it. So that's a, it's a very beautiful passage, powerful passage, I think. Um, an extraordinary moment. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, have a, I think. Thank you so much for sharing, um, I really appreciated that part of the, the work, particularly because I had a misconception that Jim Crow extended already existing racial stratification. And it gave me a new understanding about a very stark difference like that. Um, that things were not, it was not more of the same. It was very different and much right. more harsh for, for black people right. in America. Um, and uh, as you alluded to earlier, I mean, continues to be a very relevant work, uh, unfortunately. Um, so I do wonder about the success over the years, both, um, you know, it was a New York Times bestseller uh, a book um, adapted for the film and uh, stage. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder what you attribute the success of the book to and also how you've seen it change over time, um, the reception to the book change over time. Well, the reception of the book was a big surprise. I, I wrote it for the sake of history. I, I did it because I knew that if I didn't do it, no one would and their stories would be buried with them. Uh, I felt this very strong, strongly. I grew up in a family that really, uh, we love history. Um, we love our older folks, cherish our older folks in my family. Um, so I, w I was still surprised that the book did that well. And I think what happened is people really responded to uh, how, how genuine they were. Um, there's humor. There's painful passages, um, but you do have this feeling that you're getting the truth. And it's really funny, Bessie used to say that it was probably the most honest book um, ever written, she used to say, because she said, uh, we're very old and we just want to say what we want to say. And she said, you know, there's an old saying that only old folks and little children tell the truth. Okay, well, I thought, I think people really sensed that. They reacted to it, they embraced it, they loved it, and it just spread word of mouth. And it was <laughs> this huge success. Surprise. Um, I'm, I was delighted for them that they lived long enough to enjoy that. And um, they got a kick out of it. <laughs> yeah. What was your other question? It was about um, how much has it changed in terms of? Yeah, um, the reception over time to your work. <clears throat> um, it's been very constant in terms of the way that people react to it. I have noticed a lot of, of um, English as a second language teachers are using it. Uh, it's a very personal story. People relate to it from very different cultures. Um, I just got a photograph from a group in Minneapolis uh, that are reading it for that purpose. And a lot of cultures around the world do a better job than we do uh, in America with respect for older people. And I think that um, there's, a, there's a response for, from some of the immigrant community to that this is important and they, they want to listen, they want to hear what the, these women have to say. And it does cover a lot of ground about American history, so. The play and the film is um, kind of freezing a bit. You're, you're, I'm having trouble hearing you all of a sudden. 
Am I waking up? Freezing, Heba. Oh, Heba's freezing on us. Okay. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. No. Okay. No, I can't hear. Well, I I can step in and for the moment uh, we were curious about um, you were an advisor on the play and on the film and how do you how do you think they're different well they're different than the book um, and they each have a a different way to present the story um, and how how do you how can you explain the difference between the book and the play and the movie? Well, um, with the play, I, the experience that you have is that you're listening, you're hearing the sisters talk and tell you the stories that they told me. Um, I'm like an invisible character. With the, with the film, um, they added me as a character, which was kind of scary, actually, but it worked out fine. Um, you know, when you're a newspaper reporter, you're used to, you're not used to being the center of attention. You're, you're on the sides and other people are the center of attention. So it was kind of an odd experience for me, but they decided to add that as a whole other thread, the friendship that I had with the sisters. Now, the main difference, of course, and I often uh, say this to younger people who are reading the book, um, the biggest difference between the play, the film, and the book is that there's a ton more information in the book. What, just think if you were to read the book aloud, it would take, what, 23 hours, 27 hours, something like that. I don't know how many hours, depending on how fast you read. So when you have a play, just think of how much stuff doesn't go in there if it's two hours. Same thing with television. And... Um, you know, so it's, a, it's important to realize how much is left out of a theatrical adaptation and a film adaptation. And I think, you know, this may be my bias. I think, you know, I'm always focused on books because that's what I do. But um, I often point that out to people if they're, they love to watch uh, television uh, movies. And um, if there's a book, so we need to read the book. There's a lot more there. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I know I I enjoyed all three presentations. Um, I got to see the play recently, and uh, that was you know, it it was it was different. The thing that I liked about the book is the little chapter headings that you had. Whoops, we're losing people. <laughs> what happened to our crew? But I'll just keep going. They'll be back. There, Michelle's back. Mm -hmm. um, in the book, you get that summary of the time and a, you know, a little background before they talk about the certain parts. I'm trying to find the um, first one here. Well, I can't find it, but the explanation, as you said, for the time of the history that they're they're talking about. So when they're younger, you understand um, about the right. laws, the Jim Crow laws, the change that that history is put into the book, and then you get to to read about their stories. The thing I liked about the movie was meeting, seeing you in in the movie. It really it did um, because it showed the challenge of working with them because you got to see their personalities and how Bessie kind of resisted um, working with you. She wasn't so sure about that at first. She wanted to talk and then, but she was, as you said, feisty and um, it, it kind of uh, made you do your, your work. <laughs> she, she- Well, it is, any any time you interview anyone like this, you know, Sadie Sadie was the one who was gung ho about doing the book at first, and you know I remember Bessie saying, "I don't think I have time. I've got to get straight with the Lord. I don't have time." 
So Sadie said, well, Bessie and Amy and I will just go ahead and do it without you. <laughs> well, Bessie didn't like that. So she said, oh, no, you don't. So she jumped in and got involved. Now, the funny thing about Bessie is she'd been really hurt by life. She'd been hurt by white people. She'd been hurt by men. She'd been hurt by our country. Uh, Sadie had to, but she had a different personality where um, she was just more resilient. Um, and the thing is, what happens when you're talking to somebody about the most important things in their lives? You know, you're not, it's not like we were talking about the weather. I mean, it becomes a very intense friendship. And they learn very quickly whether they, whether you can trust each other with this these important stories and how the person reacts, and um, it's just an acceleration uh, of a um, of a friendship. So Bessie very quickly. <laughs> I'm not sure how clear this was in the film. Come to think of it, I'll have to go back and look at it. But Bessie. Fairly quickly, she really got into it. And I remember one day, this is how the title came about. She interrupted what we were doing. She said, you know what? This is fun. This is fun. And um, she said, I'm getting a lot off my chest. She said, we're having our say. We're having our say. And I thought, oh, is that a title? That's a title. So our, anyway, the publisher didn't like it as a title. Sisters and I decided, that's a title. It's perfect because it's an oral history. We're having our say, having our say. Oh, my gosh, we just loved it. So it, it is a very intense experience working with somebody like that. And um, it was a beautiful friendship. They did learn quickly. Uh, fortunately, I was raised right. I owe, I owe everything to my parents and my grandparents because they raised me to respect my elders. Um, my grandma who lived to 101 and great grandma who lived to whatever, 97, they, um, they were the queens. And, um, nobody questioned it. Uh, and I think the sisters realized pretty quickly that I was, um, I had, I wasn't going to try and intrude on them in terms of the older you get, the more people try to change you. This happens with older people all the time. Um, there was an issue. The sisters did not have a telephone. They did not want a telephone. And there were some people in the family who wanted them to get a phone. And, you know, there was a surgeon, uh, one of their nephews, who said, you have to have a phone. Um, well, I just, I wanted to stay out of it, you know. <laughs> but um, one day, Sadie and Bessie said to me, well, Amy, this was early on. They said, what do you think? Should we get a phone? I said, if you don't want a phone, don't get a phone. And it was like... <laughs> Abracadabra, you know, the doors opened, they, um, they realized that I was not going to um, try to control them in, in the ways that people often do, the older people get, and when they get really elderly, it happens a lot. But I saw, I did it myself when my own parents died not that long ago, they were in their 90s. And I realized I did it one day with my father. I felt he shouldn't be driving anymore. And um, I toast told him I th that until he had hurt his leg. And I said, until your leg heals, I do not think you should be driving. And I thought, listen to me. I'm telling dad what to do. And I, I don't believe in doing that to people. So um, it's just a tendency where people become very protective. And I want, I didn't want to be in that situation. I just wanted to do what pleased them. And um, if they want, they didn't want a phone. I know it was inconvenient. Believe me, it was very inconvenient for me. <laughs> no, if they want a phone, they shouldn't have a phone. So um, I think what it really comes down to is just um, we.
we had a lot of respect for each other. They respected my skills and my, my, my work ethic and um, my sensitivity to what they had been through and in life. And um, I had tremendous respect for them. And it, we became good friends. We went through a lot together in a short period of time. A lot of exciting mm -hmm. stuff. Now you, I you, took you, them to see the play in, on Booth, the Booth Theater. I snuck them in. My husband helped me. We snuck them in uh, on a matinee um, and got them into the uh, seats uh, up uh, high so they could see everything. And uh, we had a lot of good times too. We did work hard. We worked hard. They were very. This kept them going. Then they used to say the, the book kept them going because they were professional ladies and they needed, they were very happy to have a job, you know, and I would come and they'd have everything all, the table all set up for us to work. It's wonderful, just wonderful. And they did love the play and they didn't live to see the film, but they knew all about it. And I was, I would tell them what was happening with the movie and they were excited. So it was a grand time. Now, you worked with them for two years on the book, and you. what happened to your newspaper position at the New York Times? I, um, I realized that if I was going to do this book, that I had to stop writing for the Times because time was of the essence. And I had seen too many people try to do books. I'd never done a book before, but I'd seen enough people doing books that just went on. It, take, it takes a lot of time. And sometimes it goes on for years for some people um, with their process. I wanted to get this going. So I dove into it with everything I had. It was a, um, the funny thing is that people did not, uh, my colleagues did not respect my decision at the time at all. Uh, that was that was a a, um, a disappointment. I don't just mean at the New York Times. I mean just I went to a Christmas party in New York the year uh, that we started the book, and people a number of people told me I, I was ruining my career. <laughs> so they said no one's going to read that, you know, and it made me mad. Fortunately, it just when I get a when I'm in infuriated by something it just actually makes me work harder i don't give up it, it, it offended me because the sisters to me were so fantastic and fabulous and i thought their story the whole story needed to be told and foo that's what i decided to do i didn't listen to them but it is interesting how uh the media really this is 30 years ago now but was this disinterest in them. They were old, they were women, they were black, they were never married. I remember a couple of men saying that, and they never even married. I was like, well, what's that going to do with anything? Um, <laughs> they've lived, believe me, they've lived busy lives. They have a lot to say about the world. So I found that very, uh, very revealing at the time. So um, I did, I stopped working for the Times in order to do this. And um, I, I didn't, I think I, I'm absolutely certain that I made the right choice. Yeah, yeah, I've had a, a wonderful career since then. Heba, I'm so glad you're back. We, we missed you there for... Yeah, <clears throat> let's give it a try. We'll see how it goes this time. Okay. So, uh, Amy, thank you so much. You kind of just alluded to some of these ideas, but um, the sisters faced not only racism, but many types of discrimination, including ageism and sexism. And um, can you talk us uh, talk to us a little bit about how they uh, coped with what they faced? Uh, well, at the time that I knew them, they were facing a lot of age discrimination, um, of course. Uh, so there's quite a lot of that in the book. Um, Clearly, obviously, they've faced racial discrimination their whole lives, and um, and discrimination as women. Uh, it's, if it wasn't one, it was the other. It was all of the above. Um, they dealt with it through family and church. They knew who they were. They were very um, 
They were religious. Their father was uh, the first elected Episcopal bishop in uh, the USA church. And uh, so they did, they had a lot of confidence uh, in themselves with their family and their friends. And of course they had each other to rely on. Um, so this is how they dealt with it. They dealt with their disappointments um, by relying on each other. Yeah, thank you for that. Um... I know you brought up to the resiliency of Bessie, Bessie was more resilient. I think you said. Um, did you find that she was coped, coped differently or in different ways? Yes. Well, Bessie was. She would get upset. She would get mad, and you know, I kind of understand that because I'm afraid I'm a, I'm the little sister in the, the pair of sisters that I, I I understood completely because my sister is like Sadie. And she's my sister's older, the older sister, elder sister. I really understood being the little sister and feeling things very, very deeply. And um, yes, Bessie, you know, she used to worry. She used to worry all the time about was she going to get into heaven because she was she was still mad about things that had happened a hundred years ago. I used to say, well, I don't blame you for being mad about it. I'd still be mad. I'm mad now. Listen. <laughs> And Sadie was just much more of a, I think, more unusual person in some ways because her, she would be, she'd tell a terrible story and then she'd say, but, oh well, and then go on to the next thing. You know, she was just, she's the one who lived to be 109. We were planning her 110th birthday. <clears throat> uh, that, she was a survivor. She mm -hmm. did have a, she didn't take things as personally or as deeply. It's just mm -hmm. the way they were born. And then we talked about that in the book. They were just, it's just different personalities. So mm -hmm. um, I, I love the whole sister thing. And I think that did attract a lot of uh, readers. And I could certainly relate to it. <laughs> and the day I met them, I went home and I told, I called my sister and I said, you wouldn't believe these two women that I met today. We are doomed. They're having the same arguments they had from a hundred years ago. It was just as funny as it could be, but um, they had different. They had just very different personalities. And they also, uh, Bessie used to work in her garden, and when she was upset, she had a beautiful flower garden. Little ways to deal with things that were painful. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you also mentioned this earlier that they didn't get married. Um, could you share uh, with us from your book about the reasons for that? Oh, yes, I was. That's right. I was asked to read a little bit. Um, I want to just say that they were the elder sisters in this big family, and they used to say, "We've raised the world. We did not. We did. A, we. They just really weren't into. <laughs> they knew what it meant to raise children." They also just loved their careers. And the more, they, they said that the more they put into their careers, the less they wanted to give that up. And they absolutely felt that they would be expected, if they did get married, to give up um, their careers. And they they actually did, um, they had, they could have, both of them could have been married several times over, but they decided not to. So here was this, a uh, passage that I was asked to read about that. Okay. This is Bessie. I'll tell you a story. The house we own is a two-family house, and sometimes the neighbors can hear us through the wall. One time they had a guest who was up in arms, just up in arms. She heard these sounds like laughter coming from our side late at night, and she was convinced there were hands. Yes, sir, she thought we were ghosts. Our neighbor came over the next day and quizzed us down, and I said, hey, Hans, it's just the two of us being silly. It hadn't occurred to them that these two old sisters at our age would be carrying on like that. I guess they think of old folks as people who sit around like old sourpusses, but not us, no, sir. When people ask me how we've lived past 100, I say, 
Honey, we've never married. We never had husbands to worry us to death. So that's that was the line. This is we never had husbands to worry us to death. And then they would laugh. They thought, thought that was the funniest thing. And then they would tease me because I was married and I'd say, Oh, Amy, what is what's gonna happen to you? <laughs> you know men are a lot of work. That's what they used to say. So they love being independent. Independent together, living together. Um, they were very happy. They had happy lives. That's what they, they used to say. So. Michelle, you, you would you like to jump in? Sure. Uh, so, you know, there are many educators in the room. And we know one thing about this book. We know many things, but one thing is that it's used in a lot of classrooms, um, in American high school classrooms. Can you talk to us about how your book is a valuable teaching tool for children in schools? I think that, um, that teachers have told me many times that they really, they really like teaching the book because it does deal with different um, different aspects of American history, the Jim Crow laws and so on. Uh, but there's almost certainly something in there that, that, that uh, because it's such a personal story, the way they tell the stories, that children can relate to, whether it's the, the uh, illustrated children's book the Delaney sisters reach high or have ever say. Um, some people just adore the whole idea of these two sisters living alone and doing exactly what they want to do. Um, it's very inspiring. It's not, it's very um, sort of accessible. It's because of its personal. Uh, so it leads, it, it, draws people in it draws people in from different backgrounds um and i think without even realizing it um a lot of the teenagers who are reading it they acquire a lot more information about american history and american life and even where we are today and why we are where we are today from reading the book so it covers a lot of ground Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And uh, so I have one last question, one last planned question, because um, that's how we planned it. But I also see there are wonderful questions in the chat that we definitely want to get to. So I'll make this last one quick. Um, so in all of this, this whole process of writing the book and meeting the sisters and to where you are today, what has been the best part of all of this? For you the best part was all the time i got to spend with them um and being great friends with them it was, that is a treasure to me and when i think about them which i do every day and i often when i have a problem i'll say to myself well what would best you say oh, let's say you say oh. um just having the opportunity to know them and be with them. I had my chair at the dining room table. I had my chair in the living room. That's what's most precious to me as time goes by. Thank you. Uh, I can, I, let me try, I have some questions from the chat. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Barbara Truger. Uh, would like, you did share one of the stories, the sister stories, but she was wondering if there's another story you could tell about the impact of the Jim Crow era or another story that you feel um, kind of is a, a good explanation of who they were and what they faced. Well, they grew up, they had a privileged upbringing in, in, in many ways. They didn't have any money, but they grew up on the campus of St. Augs College 
in Raleigh because her father was principal, vice principal of the school, and their mother was an administrator and a teacher. Um, so they were kind of protected in a way. And this whole thing with Jim Crow happening overnight, um, and what a shock it was to them personally. Uh, I'll give you another example. They had a, the father had a cousin, Papa had a cousin who was from Florida who had been an enslaved person and she came to live with them. And she used to love to take Sadie and Bessie downtown to get limeade and penny candy. And they were no longer allowed to, they were no longer served. And it was a terrible shock to them. Um, so that, that that's another example. I mean, it's, it's, people don't realize how these laws were tailored in places to, to make it for individual reasons that are awful. Um, in North Carolina, there was, there were laws that were put in place that to put black businesses out of business. That includes a very successful funeral home um, that a black family had, and um, they had a lot of white customers, and that was, they served everybody. And overnight, they just, put well, the other, uh, the white business owners who were competing, um, they pushed through this Jim Crow law that said that black undertakers could no longer handle white people. And it just put this black family out of business overnight. And this is kind of spiteful, nasty, targeted kind of Jim Crow laws. I don't think people realize just how much of this was going on. It was different in different places. They went into effect in different areas of the country at different times, mostly in the 1890s. And how wonderful an opportunity. When, when slavery ended, Reconstruction, was there was a lot of hope. And uh, things were very positive. And this was slapped down. And that's, that's very important, I think, for people to know. And it went on and on and on, as we know, and still going on. And I don't think a lot of uh, people, uh, a lot of Americans really understand that. So. Yeah. Um, I have another question from Joan Merritt. Um, she wonders, has there been any thought of trying to get the book made into a limited series, such as Netflix? Uh, maybe, she suggests, the Obamas would be interested. <laughs> What is this saying? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. She said maybe the Obamas would be interested. Oh. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Um, you know, there's it, it, there's always a possibility of something like that happening. And the fact that the book lives on, the play continues to be performed, and people really respond to it, um, and the film, every time the movie is on television, it gets tremendous ratings. Um, so yes, it's a possibility. One never knows. Um, we, I would love to see something like that happen. Well, <laughs> we will we'll cheer on if that does happen. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> and another question from Joanne Kirkus. Um, she asks, did the sisters uh, reference notes or photos or memorabilia as they talked with you? and recalled their lives, or did they largely speak from memory? Very good question. Um, we did different things. One, uh, they had family pictures on the walls throughout the house. So we would walk around, look at the pictures, and that's always a great place to start when you're doing an oral history is photographs. And so we looked at all kinds of old stuff. And not just the stuff on the walls, but they went up in the attic and they brought things down. And um, it, is, it brings back memories. Even You know how it is when you look through an old album, you remember things. So, yes, that was definitely part of it. Um, 
you know, they showed me some of their old, they saved everything. I mean, they really did, but they were organized about it. They had, Sadie had every single tax return that she'd had since like 1917, you know. Uh, so they, and this is what I meant by that they were professional women. And I would come, we'd agree that I was coming the next day at 11 or whatever. And I'd get there and they were all ready. They had done their yoga. They, yes, they did yoga. They had done their yoga. They'd had their you know, the first nap of the day, and then they had they had everything all on a special table that was Amy's table. It was like a card table with things that they had collected for me since I'd seen them the day before. So uh, they also it was very important. And, um, I did go out and about with them doing some things to see what they were like with other people and went to the grocery store and things like that. And, I, and that would bring back memories from, from them and give me some insight to what they were like. So... That's a good question. And there's um, a lot of the pictures are in in the book. Yes. And so those. Yes, the beautiful pictures. Yeah. Um, even though the family didn't have hardly any money, it was very important. Uh, the father felt that every two years or so there should be a formal family portrait, and that it's it's. it's <laughs> I'm very grateful that they did that. Um, that's very, the pictures are very beautiful. And unusual, a lot of people didn't have pictures. I've got many letters from people who uh, didn't have family pictures like that. And they just res really responded to just the pictures alone. So. I have a couple more questions coming in but here's one another from Barbara Truger um, without a phone or a computer how did you schedule meetings with them and keep in touch why the old-fashioned way that you would say I'd see them and uh, be with them say on a Tuesday from 11 to 3 um, and believe me they had stamina they would wear me out um, before I left we would agree when I was coming back because and I mean that's what we did and that's why I always lived up to it because I had no I mean I couldn't even I could have called a neighbor I guess and said would you tell us <laughs> <laughs> I would never do that so um we scheduled everything that that way um I think it's it was very charming to lived that way with them for a while i mean basically uh if people wanted to see them they had to go over to the house to see them there were no telephone interruptions and even for you there was no cell phone in those days right that's right no yeah. cell phone no nothing so well if they had an emergency i will say that they had an emergency they had it worked out with a neighbor they had a light that they would light on uh, their porch. I don't know that they ever actually did that, but that was their their emergency system. And, uh, uh, but yes, it was, it was it was very pleasant. We weren't interrupted at all. Yeah. Nobody was tempted to look at their phone. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I often say that part of the th reason I feel that um, it worked out well um, in terms of going to interview them and so on, and when I first met them is I had about five or six stories I was working on for the New York Times at least at the same time. That was pretty typical. And the story about the sisters was really, this is something I wanted to do. And I basically, you know, there wasn't much enthusiasm for it. So I basically was pursuing it on my own time. But the great thing is we did not have cell phones at that time. Nobody knew where we were. Our editors never really knew where we were. And I do remember walking up the steps the first time in the sister's house and looking at my watch and thinking, I'm really supposed to be over in Yonkers at City Hall, but no one will ever know. So it, there are some real advantages to the old way. If, for those of you who remember the old days before we were all tethered to our phones and computers and texts and so on. So yeah. it's a good question. There's a couple more questions. I'd like to see if we could get them in. Um, 
Kim asks, uh, do you still connect with the sisters' family members who are still alive today? Yes, I do. In fact, um, uh, I'm friends with uh, quite a number of them, and uh, I'm in the Delaney family private Facebook group page. And sometimes they'll ask me questions about things. And see, they didn't have children of their own, but they had nieces and nephews. And uh, most of them are gone now, but there are grand nieces and nephews and so on. And I do know them quite well. So that's been very nice. Um, and two more questions. Let's see if we can okay. do them. Okay. Our, uh, Jeanette, uh, Jane Otto. <laughs> Jane Otto asks, are there audio recordings of your conversations? Yes. I bought myself a Marantz, which is the FBI, the, that's what they use. I have really good tapes. They're in safety deposit boxes. Um, I've never shared, I don't share them. Um, they're, they're lovely, they're very personal. Someday they'll go, someday they'll be given somewhere and they'll be available. But I took notes too at the same time. I did everything at the same time. It's a good thing I was 30 years old or whatever because it's a lot of energy. I knew that, I mean, I would ask questions. I would make notes on the side. I had a tape recorder going. Uh, I'd run home at night. I did my own transcriptions. I transcribed. I thought I knew things I wanted to ask. I did research, couldn't do, you know, research really meant going to New York Public Library or something in those days. And uh, I mean, I kept the whole ball rolling. When I put together a chapter or two, uh, the sisters, oops, let me get turned off. The sisters, I always, we went, we'd go over it because I wanted them to have the last say. Um, so it was like a, a, a constant, uh, churning a fourth of material and moving it forward because I didn't want to lose any time. And I wanted them to feel control of this, of the situation. So I kept them totally in, uh, in the loop about everything that was happening. One more question. And then we have to, uh, announce our raffle winners. So, um, Penelope Latimer asked a question that's similar to, um, the last one about, uh, other than Bessie and Sadie, what other family members have you met? And you did say that, but she says, I'm not sure if you want to reveal this. Do you have a favorite sister? <laughs> oh, I would never say if I had a favorite. If, if, I, if I did, I would never admit it. <laughs> no, I love them. As far as I'm concerned, they were like one person in some ways. So, um, no. Definitely not. I admired Sadie, and I often wished I could be more like her. I could sympathize more with Bessie. So I love them both equally. We had a wonderful conversation. I hope that you did too. And I'm so glad that um, you were all here. Um, does anyone else have anything to add to the ending of our day? We're Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you all very much. I enjoyed it very much. With great audience, great questions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you person, so much. Thank you for Amy. having me. We, we are I, so I'd glad like that just, yeah, we were I, able I, to I, have this conversation with you and a lot of uh, people in the audience that I know were, you know, very interested and in they uh, to meet you and see you and have this conversation. So. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.